I don't listen to many of the new songs being written today. That's not a comment on their quality. It's merely an observation about my particular preference in music. The first time I heard Tal Wilkenfeld's Killing Me, however, it caught my attention and my interest. Unfortunately, the YouTube rules make it nearly impossible for me to include Tal's song or even usable portions of it in my video. So, I will ask you to visit any of the links listed here, if you haven't already heard the song, and then return to this video to continue. Moving forward, I'll assume that you are either already familiar with Tal's song or you have had a chance to go see her video. From the perspective of musical composition, I have noticed that the trend in many newer songs is to simply circle around the tonic chord harmonically while outlining those individual tones making up the tonic chord melodically. The very first instance that I can remember of this current trend occurred rather blatantly in the John Lennon song Tomorrow Never Knows where Lennon intentionally writes the song using, to the greatest extent possible, only a single tonic triad. In this song, Lennon begins with a droning pedal point C tonic, a C major triad, and a melody that does nothing more than to outline the tones of that C major triad. The only interesting musical event occurs when he introduces a B flat major triad as kind of a neighbor chord to the C major triad. Some might argue that due to the B flat major triad, he has written the song in the C mixolydian mode. Others might argue the B-flat major as a modal interchange using the B-flat as a borrowed lowered or flat 7 triad from C minor, the parallel minor to C major. Either explanation works, but the real function of the B-flat major triad is only to break up the uninteresting monotony of the C major triad. Upon first listening to Tal Wilkenfeld's Killing Me, my ear was a little misled into thinking that there were perhaps more chords present in the song than there actually were. Unlike Lennon, Tal's outlining of a single tonic chord is not quite so apparent, and it took a bit of real listening to realize what was actually going on. Her song has a general dissonance to it, but what really caught my attention was the greatest dissonance coming as Tal sang the very first note. To be clear, this dissonance has nothing to do with her being off-key or hitting the wrong note. On the contrary, it is her introduction of this perfectly correct note which heightens the dissonance of the entire chord. So I decided to drill down into the music to find out why this particular note affected my ear in the way that it did. Listen to the bass line and to the dissonant notes being played by the accompanying instruments during the song's introduction. In the bass line, we see a kind of pedal tone E-flat. It is not a true pedal tone because the E-flat jumps an octave from time to time, but the effect is exactly the same. The accompaniment sounds the dissonant three notes, A-flat, B-flat, and D-flat, at the beginning of every other measure. When we align, in order, all of the notes played during this introduction, we get E-flat, B-flat, D-flat, and A-flat. This spells out an E-flat dominant 11th chord, which is missing a G natural, the third of the chord, and an F natural, the ninth of the chord. It is not unusual at all to omit the ninth from an 11th chord. The effect is only to thin out the overall thick texture of the chord. But the omission of the third from any chord is unusual, because it is the third that defines the quality of the seventh chord upon which the eleventh chord is built. In other words, depending on whether the third is a flat, a natural, or a sharp will determine whether the eleventh chord is built upon a major seventh, minor seventh, dominant seventh, 
great seventh, small seventh, half diminished or fully diminished seventh. Referring to the key signature, there is no reason to believe that the third of this chord would be anything other than a G natural. Using this G natural as the third of the chord gives us a dominant seventh quality upon which the eleventh chord is built. Normally, of course, the function of a dominant seventh is to set up a dissonance which drives the listener back to the tonic triad for a final resolution. In this case, however, it is the tonic itself which exhibits the dissonance of the dominant seventh quality, thereby having no function other than to be a mere sonority or sound. Listen again, then, to the introduction, paying particular attention to the chord quality having the missing third, followed by the sudden introduction of the third by Tal's singing of the first word, love. See if you hear the same increase in dissonance that is apparent to me. When Tal introduces the third into this chord, she reveals its dominant quality. What gives this chord its quality, dissonance, and thereby its musical tension is the interval of a diminished fifth, or tritone. that is suddenly created between the seventh of the chord, D-flat, and this newly introduced third, G-natural. I also mentioned that my ear was deceived into thinking that there were more chords than just one supporting the melodic line. Take a listen to the first half of the first verse. When we think back to John Lennon's Tomorrow Never Knows, we realize that in using the C major triad as the one chord for harmonic support, he has limited himself to three tones, C, E, and G, with which to melodically outline that chord. Tal, however, smartly uses the E-flat dominant 11th chord for her harmonic support. This gives her, potentially, an E-flat, G, B-flat, D-flat, F and A flat, with which to create the melodic outline, which gives the illusion that we may be moving off of the tonic. Notice in the illustration that she uses a number of these tones, but centers her melody around the G natural that provides the continuing dissonance of the defining tritone. Look how many times she makes use of the tritone in just one half of a verse. She even sings the tritone frequently in her melody, which tends to accentuate the dissonance even more. The second half of the verse is very nearly a repeat of the first. Now let's listen as we enter into Tal's first partial refrain. Here, Tal makes use of a very familiar musical pattern. Looking at the bass line, we see a descending, stepwise pattern beginning at scale degree 1, moving downward through scale degrees lowered 7, raised 6, and ending at an implied scale degree 5. This pattern is actually one of the variations we find when we make use of a parallel melodic minor scale. Historically, the harmonic minor followed by the melodic minor came into existence as representations of how composers were using alterations of the natural minor or aeolian mode. Originally, the natural minor included a whole step between its subtonic, scale degree 7, and tonic, scale degree 1. Over time, 
composers found the drive of the half-step between the leading tone, scale degree 7, and tonic, scale degree 1, of the major scales to be more passionate, and they began to replace the subdominant of the natural minor with the leading tone of the major. This, of course, left a little bit of an uncomfortable jump of one and one-half steps, or a minor third, between scale degrees 6 and 7 of this new harmonic minor. Over more time, composers began to fix this problem within the harmonic minor by raising scale degrees 6 and 7 when ascending between the dominant, scale degree 5, to the tonic, scale degree 1, and lowering scale degrees 6 and 7 when descending between the tonic, scale degree 1, to the dominant, scale degree 5, creating this newer melodic minor. Even more time went by, and composers started to mix and match these raised and lowered versions of scale degrees 6 and 7, giving us some well-known musical patterns, heard particularly in the bass lines, which are used to take us from the tonic, scale degree 1, downward to the dominant, scale degree 5. I'm sure you'll recognize the following patterns. This first variation gives us a pattern wherein scale degrees 6 and 7 are both raised. The next variation gives us the pattern having a raised 7 and a lowered 6. The next gives us the pattern of having a lowered 7 and a raised 6. And finally, we have a variation containing both a lowered 7 and a lowered 6. There are so many examples of these patterns that we often take them for granted. One such example is contained in the Beatles' Penny Lane. In this Penny Lane example, only a single chord, B minor, is sounded above the pattern, and it is the bass line that accounts for the changes in the qualities of the chord. However, in this next example, from the very B movie Invaders from Mars, each note within the pattern provides the basis for a different chord. The chords used to support this pattern can come from anywhere, but one very common source for chords is through the use of a modal interchange. In short, a modal interchange is an exchange of chords between a major key and its parallel minor, or vice versa. Because of the available lowered and raised scale degrees 6 and 7 contained within the key, the melodic minor is the most frequently used parallel minor for modal interchange. In this case, we have a total of six triads that we can borrow from the A melodic minor into its parallel A major key. Switching to the key of E flat major, the key in which Tal Wilkenfeld has written this song, let's take a look at how the descending 1 to 5 pattern might traditionally be used. Here we see the traditional pattern of the tonic, or one chord, descending to the borrowed subtonic, or lowered seven chord, descending to the submediant, or six chord, descending to the dominant, or five chord, 
and finally resolving back to the tonic or one chord. This sounds like But Tal has modified her harmony a bit from the traditional. Instead of using the normally borrowed lowered 7 chord from the parallel E flat minor, which would have been a D flat major triad, Tal lowers the third of the triad by one half step to F flat, making it a D flat minor triad, presumably the tone that agreed with what she heard in her mind. Since the D-flat major triad does not occur diatonically in the key of E-flat major, it is already classified as a chromatically altered chord. What Tal has done is to further alter the already chromatically altered chord to suit her needs. In addition, Tal has performed what is known as a musical elision and contraction near the end of the traditional pattern. A musical elision and contraction works in much the same way as a linguistic elision and contraction. Some word combinations are so familiar to us that we can delete certain letters and contract the remaining letters together to form a new word which we recognize as having the same meaning. For example, we can take the two familiar words can, not, delete the N-O from the word not, and contract the remaining letter T to form the single word can't which we understand to mean the same thing as cannot. In our traditional 1 to 5 descending pattern, the dominant to tonic or 5 to 1 relationship is extremely familiar to our ears. So much so that we can, as Tal has done, delete the dominant or 5 chord completely, contract the tonic or 1 chord into its place, and land on the expected scale degree 5, which is itself part of the tonic triad. Even if scale degree 5 is not part of the bass line, as long as it is present in any one of the other voices, it will be heard as a resolution to the 1 to 5 descending pattern. Thus, we can see these modifications in the music itself. Let's listen once more to the passage, this time with the pattern enhanced by choral voices, so that our modified 1 to 5 descending pattern is clear. After the next verse, Tal returns to this refrain, but again modifies it, taking it in a completely new direction. Listen to what she has done with the repeat of this refrain. Tal begins the refrain using the same chords as she used previously, namely the D flat minor, or lowered 7 chord, followed by the C minor, or 6 chord. But from here, she takes off in a completely new direction using a chord succession that includes an F major triad followed by a C major triad, returning to the F major triad, followed by an A minor triad, returning to the F major triad, with a final return to our original E flat major tonic triad. Previously, Tal used the familiar pattern of scale degree 1 to scale degree lowered 7 to scale degree 6 to scale degree 5. Certainly, we hear the same pattern repeated in this refrain, but it is a little different. In what way is it different? As we said, Tal uses the same scale degree 1 to scale degree lowered 7 to begin our pattern. But observe that when she reaches scale degree 6, she extends it across quite a few measures. We can say then that she has prolonged scale degree 6. But for what reason? She uses scale degree 6 as a common tone to affect a change of key that gives her an opportunity for both more music and a new tonal direction. We know that we have entered the key of F major by the presence of both the E natural and A natural tones, and the chord sequence of F major to C major to F major to A minor to F major. 
This change of key, by the way, does not constitute a modulation as much as what we might call a minor excursion into a related key center. Notice that our prolonged tone of C natural is common to every triad in this new chord succession. When we call this an excursion to a related key center, just how exactly is E flat major related to F major? The key signature of E flat major contains three flats B flat, E flat, and A flat. The key signature of F major contains only one flat, B flat. There are no common chords between the keys of E flat major and F major. Therefore, there must be some intermediate key that contains triads common to both E flat major and F major. When we look at the key signature of B flat major, we find it contains two flats. B flat and E flat. This key contains three common triads from both E flat and F. Two triads from E flat, E flat major and B flat major, and two triads from F, F major and B flat major. Note also the pattern that occurs. B flat is the dominant in the key of E flat, and the tonic in the key of B flat. The dominant of B flat major is F, which is the tonic of F major. It is worthwhile to note that C is the dominant in the key of F major. We can show the relationships between these triads in terms of standard chord grammar in the following way. The dominant, or 5 chord, in the key of E flat major is a B flat major triad. We would indicate it as an uppercase Roman numeral 5 in standard chord grammar. The tonic, or one chord, in the key of B flat major is the B flat major triad, which was our dominant in the original key of E flat major. We can relate this to our original key of E flat major by describing it as the tonic of our previous key's dominant. We can indicate it grammatically by placing an uppercase Roman numeral 1 inside a bracket, while placing a smaller uppercase Roman numeral 5 just outside the bracket to indicate that as it relates to the key of E flat, this chord is the 1 of 5. The dominant or 5 chord in the key of B flat major is the F major triad. We can relate this to our original key of E flat major by describing it as the dominant of the dominant of the previous key. We can indicate it grammatically by placing an uppercase Roman numeral 5 inside a bracket while placing a smaller uppercase Roman numeral 5 just outside the bracket to indicate that in the key of E flat, this chord is the 5 of 5. The tonic, or one chord, in the key of F major is the F major triad, which was our dominant in the previous key of B flat major. We can relate this to our original key of E flat major by describing it as the tonic of the dominant of the dominant. We can indicate it grammatically by placing an uppercase Roman numeral 1 inside a bracket while placing a smaller uppercase Roman numeral 5 inside a second bracket and another uppercase Roman numeral 5 just outside the second bracket to indicate that this chord is the 1 of 5 of 5. The dominant or 5 chord in the key of F major is the C major triad. We can relate this to our original key of E flat major by describing it as the dominant of the dominant of the dominant. We can indicate it grammatically by placing an uppercase Roman numeral 5 inside a bracket while placing a smaller uppercase Roman numeral 5 inside a second bracket and another uppercase Roman numeral 5 just outside the second bracket to indicate that this chord is the 5 of 5 of 5. The relationship between all the chords in the key of F major and the original key of E flat major can be shown using the chord grammar just described. We would read the chord grammar in the following manner. D flat minor to C minor represent the lowered 7 and 6 triads in the key of E flat major. The F, C, F, and A minor represent the 1, 5, 1, and 3 triads in the key of F, but with F representing the 5 triad within the key of B flat major, while B flat represents the 5 triad within the key of E flat major. The remaining F and E flat triads represent the 5 and 4 triads in the key of B flat major, with B flat representing the 5 triad in the key of E flat major. 
The E-flat triad also represents a shared triad in both the keys of B-flat major and E-flat major. This E-flat functions as a pivot chord, which returns us nicely to the original key of E-flat major from both keys of F major and B-flat major. In all, this is an excursion that our ears can make sense of and follow easily. The remainder of the song is a repeat of the verses and refrains that we have already examined. Although I know from her bio that Tal Wilkenfeld is an educated musician who studied at the Los Angeles College of Music, I don't know if it is composition and theory or performance that made up her primary curriculum. I know she is a talented and accomplished bassist and that she has performed professionally with some of the highest rated groups in the industry. As I said, her song, Killing Me, caught my attention and I enjoyed the process of analyzing it. I hope you took something away from this tutorial. I'll be back again with some new things. Thanks for listening.